On cold and dark October nights, when northwest gales to blow, you can see the Royal Tower off Coombs Point all aglow. A side wheel sailing ship, she was a packet of renown. She sailed from Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, down to Boston town. The cargo was a circus, horses, lions, camels too. A leopard and an elephant, a tiger and one old new. Aboard her were three score and twelve and a crew of twenty-one. And thirty-three would perish ere that fateful night was done. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Five Reese Files. Today is Wednesday, yep, Wednesday, March uh, 9th, 2016. I'm your host, Heather, also known as Boutros Babe on Ravelry and Plurk, and Five Reese Files on Twitter and Instagram. You can find the shop at shop.highlandhandmates.com and this podcast at thefivereesefiles.com, um, and the blog and all other sorts of goodies are at just highlandhandmaids.com. If this is your first time joining me, welcome. If you're coming back, thanks for being patient. I know it's been a while since I've recorded. Sorry. Um, how have you been? How was your How was your February? Uh, my February was crazy, busy, and so busy, in fact, that I didn't have time really to podcast. I mean, I could have possibly found time, but not found time to put my thoughts together into some sort of coherent podcast for you guys. So uh, maybe I should say you're welcome instead of you're sorry. But uh, February is over now, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it and the things that I did. And then uh, we're going to look forward into March. And yeah, so let's get started. Um, Weeks in review. February, I think I told you in the last episode that February got busy for me in a hurry. I had my first show of the year to prep for, which is spa, which I'll get up to in a minute. Um, a large wholesale order from Fiberspace. Their wholesale orders are are large and in charge, and I try and get those done as quickly as possible because they are large and in charge, and they order for me fairly frequently, so I feel like my turnaround time with them needs to be quick. Uh, a smaller wholesale order came through, and... Uh, I took a weekend excursion, uh, which I'll also talk about in a minute. But I, I think I'd said last month, or in January, I suppose two months ago, that February had gotten wholly busy and sort of unexpectedly so. Um, the club is also going great, but the club is a lot of work. Uh, last year's club I was able to do in one round in my holding cabinet, which will do 18 pans um, or 54 skeins, I think it is. Uh, because I have more than 70 units in the club, it actually takes me longer. It takes me two days because although I can do another round the same day in my holding cabinet, I don't have any place to dry them. So, uh, cause I can realistically only maybe dry about 18 pans in a day. So, um, it just does take more work and there's more, um, scanning and dividing fiber and all that. So there is still room in the club. If you are not yet in the club and you'd like to be, please um, go to highlandhandmaids.com slash club and you can still join the club. I've not yet reached my 100 person uh, maximum. Uh, where I'm having a lot of fun with that. So, uh, and I'm not going to show you the goodies because it's not the 15th yet and I don't want to spoil anybody. You can find spoiler picks in the Highland Hammonds Ravelry group if you'd like to see what I died for either January or February. Okay, so it was busy. In the middle of all of the busy Highland Handmade stuff, I took a weekend and went to California. Now, I'm 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 looking uneasy because I don't do this very often. Um, I have wholesale orders and shows and custom orders and things that people are waiting for, and yet I took a weekend and went out to California to hang out with my friends. And <sighs> The business person in me wants to apologize for that. Oh, hi, buddy. But the 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 girl in me who needed to hang out with her friends is totally unrepentant. Um, I left Maine. Well, um, Paul, I'm going to sneeze, maybe. <coughs> Excuse me. Hopefully that was just one. They usually come in groups of, like, 12. Uh Paul and I had discussed it months before, and I we had agreed that I was going to go take a weekend away. I don't vacation very often, and when we do travel, it's almost always for the business. So um, 
I'm in a, uh, a I, I'm, I'm in a Facebook group with a bunch of girls, and um, we're all over the world, Germany, Costa Rica, uh, all over the U.S. as well, uh, Texas, California, New York, uh, everywhere. And we're a really tight-knit group of, of ladies, and there was an event, an author event, happening in Sacramento on February 20th. It... Um, it was called a Love and 50 Sacramento author event or signing event, something like that. Anyway, so there's 50 romance novel authors, and they get together and sign stuff for readers who come and talk to them. That may not sound like your thing, and it doesn't have to be, but my friends April and Penny are both going to be signing. So I decided to go, and then I convinced most of the, the core group of ladies to be able to go. A couple of us weren't able to make it. Um, sorry. My friend, Laura, who lives in Costa Rica, couldn't make it. Jen, who lives in Germany, did make it. Um, but there were a couple other whose scheduling didn't work out or whatnot. So, But the majority of us were there, and we had an amazing time. Paul brought me down to one of the group members who lives in Maine, Amanda. He brought me down to her house on Thursday. We get up at 3 o'clock Thursday, Friday morning, flew out of Boston Friday at 7. So we... we her husband drove us to Portland. We got on a bus from Portland to Boston, got off the bus in Boston, got on the plane. The plane took us to Seattle first and then down to Sacramento. It was wonderful. We had wonderful weather. It was a little, I don't want to say drizzly, but a little cloudy um, on Friday. But both Saturday and Sunday were beautiful. I, I had just my leather coat on. I didn't have my winter coat. It was lovely. Sunday was like 70 degrees. Because of the way flights work in the U.S., you fly from the East Coast to the West Coast in the morning, and you fly from the West Coast to the East Coast overnight. <laughs> Sorry, my phone is making noises. Um, oh, you know what? Let me mute this because I don't know how many messages she's going to make. Um, she's actually one of my book club my group members. Okay, so... Um, what was I saying? I'm totally lost. Sorry. <laughs> Sunday was beautiful. It was 70 degrees. Oh, so I flew home on an overnight. Now, I do not like flying overnights. Red eyes. Not because it takes a lot of my time, because what are you going to be doing anyway? Sleeping. But because then it takes me all the next day to get home from Boston, because I need somebody to get I need a way to get close to somebody who can bring me home. I'm about three and a half. I'm probably almost five hours from Boston here. So um, I have to get either to Bangor or Portland. And since I was driving, anyway, so I left Sunday night. We had all day Sunday in Sacramento, which if you've never been to old Sacramento, you totally should go. It was wonderful. Totally touristy and ritzy and cheesy boardwalks, the whole thing. It was wonderful. Um, flew home at like 11 o'clock Sunday night, got into Boston at like nine o'clock in the morning, flew to the bus station, um, not flew literally, like walked quickly to the bus station where we got on the bus and I actually ended up riding all the way to Bangor. I didn't get to Bangor until 3.30 in the afternoon and Paul picked me up at 5.30 when he got out of work and came there. So I, it was a long, it was like 24 hours of travel both ways. Didn't matter. I had a wonderful time. I would do it again in a heartbeat. It was fabulous. Unfortunately, my friend Penny um, was ill and could not make it. That sucks because I was really looking forward to actually meeting her in real life. Penny is the author of the Nan Rothall Seeks Human book and the Knitting in the City series that I have talked about endlessly on here. If you haven't read them, you need to. Uh, I do editing work for Penny. Uh, however, my author friend April of April White books who does the marking in time series which is also amazing it's sort of a YA urban fantasy paranormal with romance tones to it oh my god it's so good you should read it she was there and April is wonderful and everybody was wonderful it was so good um the only downside to that trip was that we went out to dinner Friday night and had an amazing meal and I left my caddy wampus hat in the restaurant the cattywampus hat that I snow dyed, that I had so much fun with, that I've talked about endlessly because I love it so much, left at the restaurant. And I went back the next day and like almost tackled the waiter who was there that night and said, do you remember my hat? Did you see it? Did you find it? And they did remember it. 
but it wasn't in Lost and Found, which means that somebody who works at that restaurant took it home with them. So that was sad, but I guess maybe it's being loved where it is now, I hope. Um, I was just really disappointed. But that's okay. There's nothing much to be done about it, I guess. Um, I can always knit another. I mean, I won't have yarn that looks exactly like that, but I am a dyer. I am capable of making another skein of yarn. That pleases me. But other than that, it was fantastic. So I came home Monday night, and then Tuesday morning, had to finish dyeing for spa. The Netta Spa event, which is the New England Textile Association's um, spa event, is a... It's sort of like a retreat, but open to the public, too. Um, it takes place in a couple of hotels, the main hotel being the Hilton Garden Inn in Freeport, which is the home of L.L. Bean and various and sundry other things. Um, and it's a whole weekend, uh, and vending is Friday night, all day Saturday, and then a couple hours on Sunday morning. And we had so much fun. Paul came with me, and... We got the booth set up with no problem and no worries, and we got it taken down in less than an hour, which always happy when that happens because it means nothing's gone wrong. We haven't had any like fights. I can sometimes get stressed out um, when setting up the booth, but I think I'm at that point where I've done it enough now that I have like three or four different options for booth setups. So if one setup isn't working, I can just flip mentally to the next setup and go from there. Uh, I had no booth mishaps this year. Last year, half of my booth destroyed half of Spunky Eclectic's booth. This year, that did not happen. Uh, I zip tie my grid walls now to my canopy frame. I just don't bring the canopy sides or top. And uh, it was fine. Spunky Eclectic gave me crap about, oh, don't wreck my booth. And several other people did. It was well remembered that Highland Handmaid's, you know, booth busted into Spunky's. But none of that happened. And that was good. Um, always fun to see my friends you know, um, Enchanted Knoll, Josette, uh, Heather of Mad Color Fiber Arts, obviously Amy of Spunky Eclectic, who Amy is right now in Colorado filming a new craftsy class, and you are going to want to check that out. It's a spinning class. That's all I can tell you, but it's going to be amazing. Um, and there's, uh, there's a bunch of vendors that I really enjoy spending time with, but it's always great to see happy faces who are ready for color, because although we've had a pleasant winter, it is still winter here and uh, everybody's ready for a little bit of color. So it was a great weekend. Um, Spa remains one of my best shows at least so far and we had a great time. The only other thing I did in February, the only other thing I did, like I didn't do anything else all month, um, was I applied to vend at Rhinebeck. Now I have no expectation that that answer is going to be yes. For those of you who were following along at home, I applied to Maryland, did not get in. Got that letter on Christmas Eve. Have been sitting on it, not telling you guys because it breaks my heart a little bit. Maybe next year. Um, I would not have applied to Rhinebeck had I not been encouraged by Chris and James of Into the World. I hung out with them at Maryland Sheep and Wool last year, and they're wonderful. And um, Chris especially is very supportive and says, you know, you need to apply. You will do great. It's a great fit for you. They would be crazy not to have you. She's just so wonderful. So Chris and big ol' squishy love for you. Uh, and James too. So I applied. Again, no expectation that I will get in, but at least I've started the process. And if I apply enough times for enough years, perhaps I'll get in. So we'll see. Uh, I also, somebody on Instagram posted a comment that they wanted Paul and I to come to SAF, which is the, um, oh God, I'm going to get it wrong. SAF, S-A-F-F. -F. Southern, it's not Southern Adirondack, Southern Animal Fiber Festival, I think. I'm sorry if I'm getting that wrong. Um, it takes place in Kentucky, I think, right over the, no, North Carolina, sorry, North Carolina, right off, right off of Tennessee. Um, and there may have been a hashtag involved. Uh, the hashtag was something like, please come to SAF Highland Handmaids, like a big long hashtag. And of course, that just tickled Paul's funny bone right from the beginning. So he started looking up information about SAF and said, you know, babe, we really ought to do this. And I was like, look, I would love to do this. Uh, October, late October is the weekend after our NEOC retreat, um, which would make it two weeks after Rhinebeck. Fall in the Carolinas, like 
sure, you're not going to get any argument from me, but are you coming with me because I'm not doing it by myself? And he was like, sure, what, what the heck? Um, so uh, we are going to apply. They're on a wait list, so I don't know if we'll get in, but it would, maybe that will be my luck. Maybe, maybe I will get into both Rhinebeck and Saf, which are in the same month, the same year. That would be, that will give me a heart attack. <laughs> I don't even know how I will handle that. Like, who I am. Um, when I'm stressed, I tend to pop migraines. Um, migraines are something that run in my the maternal side of my family. And I have been very lucky that I am very barely touched by them. Uh, but when I do get a migraine, they're pretty epic. And I popped one right when we were finished setting up the booth for spa. And I it's the second one I've popped this year. And I don't know why. Because I don't know why I was stressed about spa. Because I was excited about spa. But I luckily, I had my migraine meds with me. So I was able to stop it before it became debilitating. But I don't even want to think about, I don't even want to think about the stress of two major out of state shows in the same month, plus the retreat in between. Like, I, whatever, why not just be crazy, right? Why not just go for it all? So that's the plan. So if you're on the acceptance boards to either of those events, look for my application. Okay, so that's pretty much what I've been doing. Um, it's, I got back from spa and quite frankly, took a week to rest. Uh, it, I had a, the club had to go out right when I got back. So Monday, the 29th, I was occupied with sending that out and it didn't actually get to go out on the 29th. I think, I think it went out till the first, um, just because of the way the mail truck comes and post office and all that. And then, so it was Tuesday, I think, before I had a day to, like, rest. And it had been three weeks or something but since I'd been able to sleep in and just catch up and stay in my pajamas and pat my dog and sip my coffee in leisurely, you know, sort of time. So I had a really good time. Um, it was nice. I take this week a little bit. Uh, came to some realizations about my fitness that I really needed to accept, um, I've been not been on the treadmill for three weeks after starting the year so great running three times every week. Um, honestly, when I'm prepping for a show, I don't have the energy to run. It's very um, tiring. I'm, I have poor biomechanics, so it does hurt a little bit to run. And the weather's been cold, so there's, I'm certainly not running outside. But it's I'm when I'm mentally and physically exhausted from a day of dying, I don't want to get on the treadmill. My back aches, my feet are killing me. I'm exhausted. I'm not getting on that treadmill. So it'd been like three weeks since I've run. So yesterday, um, this week I finally was like, look enough. It's time to get back on the wagon. I'm nearly the heaviest I've ever been. So it's time. So I got, went to the gym yesterday and got on the treadmill, which as an aside, if you go to a gym and they have cardio equipment, don't be that dude that doesn't sign up. Okay. There were eight people on the treadmill yesterday over the course of me, the, my time spent at the gym, and I was the only person who signed up for any of them, any of the gym machines. There were so many people on treadmills that did not bother to sign up, and I'm not quite rude enough to say something, but neither was the person working the counter, so I just stewed for a little while, and then I ended up doing um, a bit of a arm and core workout. And that core workout being the first one in more than a month was a bad idea because I can barely laugh, sit up, lay down, or do anything that requires abs. Reverse crunches on the Roman chair. Get you every time. But that's, I have to go back to the gym tomorrow. Uh, I say have to. The proceeds from spa went to um, getting some needed maintenance work done on the van. The van is my show vehicle as well as my personal vehicle. So it needed a new wheel bearing, two new front struts. After the two new struts, it needed a front end alignment. It had its brakes done, uh, a bunch of other stuff. And the alignment was done poorly yesterday because I have to go back tomorrow because now the van pulls to the left, which means pulls into the median. So I'm constantly crossing the yellow line if I'm not paying attention. It's a problem. So I'm going back tomorrow. Um, so that means if I'm going that way, I might as well go to the gym, right? My appointment's not until 11, so I drop Paul off at 7, go to the gym for an hour or two, and then I'll go back to the garage. What can you do? All right, you're here for knitting, not for me whining about my vehicle. 
So I have not been doing a whole lot of knitting. Despite there being travel on a plane, I was trying to sleep on the way home and the way out I was just kind of excited. So I didn't get a whole lot of knitting done, but I have done a few things. The first thing that I've done that I've been swinging around here is the Fairy Tale Winter Hat by Susan B. Anderson. The color is more true back here, but if you want to see the pattern, that's what it is. The Fairy Tale Winter Hat is a hat that Susan B. Anderson designed for a kit with tangerine designs. I believe um, Melissa Sibley or Amelia Bella also had a design in that kit. Uh, and the rights have reverted back to her. So I could get the pattern once the rights reverted back to Susan. So I downloaded it and knit it out of my Highland Handmaid's Green Ash Worsted Yarn, which is the yarn called for in the pattern. Uh, I have six more skeins of the Kineo colorway, which is a light blue that Susan knit the hat out of that I will be putting in the shop. Uh, I just haven't done so yet. But I knit this out of the Gulf Haggis colorway, which is a, if you can see, the light mane is so blue. Uh, that's better. It's a harvest gold mustardy kind of color. And I've got my hair up, so I don't know how well this will go. But you can see, even with my hair up in an obnoxious bun, it's still plenty big. It has this really long ribbing section that um, makes your hat nice and warm and covers your ears really well. And I do not yet obviously have a pom-pom on it. I'm not going to do the Bernat pom-pom just because I think my cats would eat it. But I have um, this much yarn left over and I think I will be able to make a decent pom-pom out of this. I have not made a pom-pom in a really long time so I'm actually going to YouTube some tutorials before I do this because I don't want it to look crappy because this is all the yarn I have left. So I need to make it look nice. Um, my friend Christine, Pat's Fan 11 or Pat's Fan 111, makes amazing pom-poms. So I might ask her if she uses a specific tutorial. Speaking of Christine, get well soon. Uh, she just had surgery. So I hope you feel better soon, Christine. The other thing I've been knitting is also a hat. Uh, it is the sock head hat, which I have knit twice before. This yarn is Highland Handmaid's Mountain Maple Sock, which is 100% um, Superwash BFL. It's uh, a lovely, heavier fingering weight yarn. It is smooth because it is Superwash BFL, uh, which is a long wool, but also Superwash. And it has a little bit of sheen to it. This hat is actually going to be for my friend, um, Leanne. She is wonderful and inspiring, and I adore her. You can see there's some pooling going on on the back there, but we won't look at that. Uh, and she wants a sock head hat, so she's getting one. This is, I think, going to look great. She has very bright blue eyes, powder blue eyes, and I think they're going to make her eyes pop. And She's got a white wear coat, so this is not a secret. She knows it's coming. Not that she watches my podcast. Uh, but that's the only other thing I've been knitting, really. Uh, I knit one of those. I knit. I want to say I knit the four inches of the sock head hat in one night because I, I have this new coffee. And if you guys know me in person, you know that coffee affects me a lot. I have my normal cup of coffee in the morning, and then if I have any more caffeine throughout the day, I'm basically crazy pants, and I don't ever go to sleep. Like, it can be 3, 4 o'clock in the morning before I finally feel tired, even if I have the coffee at noon. The ladies at Dunkin' Donuts know if it's p.m. on the clock, I have to have decaf. They don't even ask me. They just give it to me. That's how crazy I get. But I bought this coffee at the Belfast Co-op this past weekend. Um, Paul and I had errands to run, so we went to the coast. And it's called the Royal Tar Blend from 44 North Coffee, which is a main um, company, coffee company. Their website is 44northcoffee.com. 44 um, it's potent and lovely. Uh, it says, full steam ahead, this coffee boasts a harmonium of rich Swiss chocolate, fruit and nut with a strong smoky finish. And they are not kidding. Um, it's delicious. It's organically grown and roasted locally, so it's very fresh. It was roasted on the 25th. Um, and I ground, the, there were whole beans, and I ground the beans right at the co-op. It's delicious. And if you like strong coffee, you should maybe check them out. Um, the Royal Tar is the song that I put in the opening credits, and uh, they'll be at the end credits too. The Royal Tar is actually the name of a ship that, true story, sank off the coast of Maine back in 1836. I could tell you, but I'll read this because it has a little story. It says, The tale of the circus ship Royal Tar is one of adventure, tragedy, and mystery. 
On October 25th, 1836, mid-journey between New Brunswick, Canada and Portland, Maine, the dreaded cry of fire was heard below decks. With the smoke billowing from the boilers and flames shooting skyward, the ship's frenzied passengers began plunging into the icy waters off Deer Isle. Aboard the 160-foot Royal Tar were more than 90 people and a menagerie of circus animals, including two big lions, a Bengal tiger, camels, snakes, and a beloved elephant named Mogul. Many perished, but as the legend goes, some of the wild beasts swam to nearby islands where their descendants thrive today. Be on the lookout for them. Um, I thought Schooner Fair did a really great song about the Royal Tar, and I've been listening to Schooner Fair literally my entire life. I've never not had Schooner Fair playing in the soundtrack of my life. So when I saw the Royal Tar coffee, I bought it. Bought it for the name. You guys do the same thing to Yarn. Don't tell me you don't. And uh, it turns out it's delicious. I may have had an extra cup this morning, too. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second and blow my nose, so I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that, um, but I'm sure you didn't want to listen to me sniffling anymore. So that was knitting. For spinning, I am finally plying that Rambouillet in the fall colors that I've been showing you forever. I'm looking over here because that's where it is. I'm maybe a little bit shy of halfway done the plying. It's just going to be a two-ply. I'm plying from a center pull ball, both ends, inside and outside. That's generally what I do. I'm really ready for it to be done. Uh, really ready for it to be done. And then I have uh, just some odds and ends to finish up after that, and then I'm going to find the next wonderful thing to spin. I don't have that yet. But soon. Um, dye pots. There obviously have been things in the dye pots. Now, I have uploaded all of the waifs and strays uh, in the yarn side up to the shop. If you're not familiar with the waifs and strays updates is... Basically, at the start of show season, I dye up everything I need for the show, which is about 200 pounds of yarn and fiber. Any full dye lots, which is a set of three skeins or three braids of fiber, that don't sell get put in containers to go to the next show. And at the end of show season, everything goes up in the shop. Um, but yarn, especially, doesn't expire, so it's fine to take from one show to the next. Um, those stay there. Anything that is not a full dye lot, so one or two skeins left, comes home and goes into the shop. Those are the waifs and strays. Um, all of the yarn is up. There is a um, bunch of sock, a little bit of lace, um, some worsteds, a little bit of everything. And the fiber is going up today. So um, I didn't take as much fiber to spa as I did last year because last year I felt like my booth was over full and not so shoppable. Uh, and I wanted more space in between the fiber. So aside from what is in the shop already, which is what was in the shop before I left for spa and didn't sell while I was at spa, so it goes right back into the shop, um, I'm also going to have braids of Cheviot, Superwash Targi, and Superwash BFL in um, the shop. I have taken the photos, and I have the... I, oh, I already put it in the, cam the computer. My memory card is ready for me to edit the photos and put them up. I will probably do that while the podcast is saving and uploading and doing all that good stuff. Uh, so hopefully by the time you see this, those will be up as well. Um, after that, for the rest of the month of March, I plan on hopefully doing self-striping. Now today is Wednesday, so it's not going to be this week because self-striping takes me five times longer than regular yarn takes me. But I do plan on doing some um, self-striping colorways for the month of March. So be on the lookout for that. I will post pictures before I do updates so that you'll know when the update is. Check my Instagram and Facebook feeds for that. That's pretty much where I'm posting these days. Uh, I post into the Ravelry group once I've done an update, but I don't usually say, hey, an update's coming. Uh, but I do do that on Facebook and Instagram. So um, facebook.com slash highlandhandmaids. And the Instagram username is Fiberista Files. I almost just blurped that out of my mouth. Learn how to drink Brady Egg. Okay, so that's pretty much it for that sort of stuff. Um, as far as growth is concerned, obviously I'm applying to some more shows. Processes, you, you just heard it. Um, the Waifs and Strays is sort of what I do um, after a show. It takes a little bit longer when I'm breaking down. I don't just throw everything and then divide it out later but it makes it faster when I come home and I'm putting things up in different places. I still do need to take a detailed inventory of what I'm bringing with me uh, to the next show because I haven't actually written it down, but uh, that's nothing you guys need to worry about unless you're coming to a show, in which case, yay. 
Okay. Excuse me. Uh, the next upcoming thing that I'm doing is the Maine Spinners Registry Annual Meeting, which is in Gardner on Saturday, March 19th from 10 to 3 at Gardner High School. And uh, if you are in the area and you want to stop by, you can totally do that. Uh, Maine Spinners Registry is a great group. They have a, a, a reasonably well-maintained website where they have um, postings for things that are on sale and fiber events that are happening. They do their own retreat every year in the fall as well, I believe in the Sugarloaf region or maybe in the summer. Uh, but they're a nice group of folks and I do pretty well at this. Uh, and it ties in because I'm from Gardner originally, so I'm able to see my family, my grandmother at the um, rehabilitation center that she's at in water in Win Windsor, Windsor, Winthrop, 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 sorry, Windsor is where the fiber frolic is, in Winthrop, uh, and I actually am getting my taxes done that morning, woo, so fun, not really, but it's got to be done. And we're going to, uh, actually, the tax people that my parents go to because the company that we used uh, has gone defunct and they are junk. So I'm going to somebody that my parents at least trust. So hopefully that won't cost us as much as it cost us last year. I pay to get my taxes done because I'm a sole proprietorship and owning your own business makes things very complicated. And quite frankly, I would rather pay somebody to know that it is done right than do it myself and hope. In addition to uh, making sure that it's right, most tax places will um, help you if you get audited by the IRS, and God forbid that ever happened to me, I would cry a lot. So it's worth it to me to pay the money to have somebody there in case I need them. So there's that. Okay. The only thing left to talk about is grabby hands. And for grabby hands, this week I have um, a new cooperative press book called River Gansies. Strike into Loop, Swaving, and Other Yorkshire Knitting Curiosities Revived from the Archives by Penelope Lister Hemingway, the Knitting Genealogist. Uh, I am going to be honest with you and tell you that Gansies are not my favorite type of sweater. I don't really like um, textured knitting as the Gansey style, which is combinations of knits and pearls. If I'm going to do it textured, I want cables or something like that. Um, so it's not necessarily up my alley, but... If it is up your alley, it's worth looking at. And even if you're not sure, check it out. You may find that the book has got some useful information for you that is worth picking up. Um, I don't have anything against River Gansies. It's just not my preferred method of knitting. So, uh, and we all know I'm sweater challenged as it is. So uh, stick around for that. If you're not going to stick around because you've already heard reviews elsewhere, then I will say thank you for tuning in uh, and happy spinning and knitting and if you are going to stick around, hold tight because I'm just going to switch the camera around so I can show you what I see as I do uh, the review. So hang tight. This review is for River Gansey's Strike into Loop, Swaving, and Other Yorkshire Newton Curiosities Revived from the Archives by Penelope Lister Hemingway and published by Cooperative Press. The first thing that you should know is that this is not primarily a knitting pattern book. This is the sort of book that you read to more fully understand the history and cultural roots of Gansey's and is much more for your edification than it is for just knitting. There are some patterns at the end and I will show you some of those, um, but that's not the point of this book. So the foreword talks about the author's um, introduction to a grandfather and the sort of interesting person that he is um, with a few photos and then the next section the introduction talks about the history now most of this book is composed of the history not only of the area in which Guernsey's came from um, Gansey's I should say uh, which is the Yorkshire area but Yorkshire itself's knitting history and on um, like that it it very much is like a documentary in words very interestingly written uh, it is entertaining and not terribly dry uh, the author has a great voice there are some pictures interspersed throughout but it like I said it before it's not a knitting book as much as it is a knitting history book 
I will say that all the photos are well um, referenced. So this says, uh, Ceiling Fleet Village School Regulations. Their own work or knitting from home may be brought, but no kind of fancy work can be allowed. And then courtesy, Stilling Fleet Parish Church. So it shows where the image came from and what it is, and in this case gives a quote from it as well. Gansey history specifically is mentioned in the first real chapter, and there's quite a bit of it. Um, origins and myths, and there's of course the myth that, um, as with Aaron sweaters, that sailors had their initials or names knit into them and that was or had specific motifs used and that was how you identified them if they were lost at sea. She talks about that. Um, even the origin of the word Gansey and how it and the word Guernsey is coincidental. Um, you heard me use it incorrectly just a second ago. It's just because I was reading this section. Um, the modern word yarn comes from the Old Norse garn. Um, the initial G in Old English was actually pronounced more like a cross between an H and a Y. So the Gansey, you know, she goes on to the whole um, phonological origins of the word. So, and then the origins of the actual Gansey, what it is, um, dates back to the 1600s and um, specifically Charles I, who was beheaded in 1649. I'm not going to go into the whole story, but it is very, like I said, interesting and well written. Chapter two is knitting in schools, prisons, and homes. So it's about um, sort of where and when and how and what sorts of people were knitting, um, all of that. At homeschooling knitters and farm knitting schools, knitting was cross cultural at this point. Chapter three is called Inland Waterways Gansies. I love this photo of this old geezer with this pipe. I love him. Uh, it says an unknown salty sea tar from a sardine advertisement wearing the eye of God motif, which is here in his Gansey. Chapter four is motifs, superstition, folklore, and inland Gansies. Chapter five is Pioneer Yorkshire Knitters in the New World. So once they left Yorkshire and moved elsewhere. Uh, even goes as far as Illinois. The next section is Gansey Techniques where it talks about um, not only what size needle is generally used, which is an insanely small um, two, US two, 300 stitch plus cast on. It's not... I mean, it's definitely unique to this type of sweater. Um, so she talks about the usual cast on and then two other cast ons, the knotted cast on and Channel Island cast on. Um, seam stitches, the, the sweater is generally knit without seams. They have a main body and whether or not they have cables. Um, The underarm gusset, there's like a triangular space underneath the underarm. The back and front, excuse me, shoulders, and there's more than one type of shoulders. The simple shoulder, um, this is the filey shoulder treatment. So a fancy shoulder saddle, left shoulder, right shoulder, um, how to pick up the sleeves, the gusset under the arm. Two are horizontal buttonholes in case you want to do a button front, the neck. Um, all not to be um, given to you as pattern notes, but as a theoretical um, approach to how you would knit a Kansi. There's some photos here of sheepies and hand spun. Hand spinning for traditional knitting. This talks about spinning yarn for a Gansey. Do not ever let my husband see this. I don't want to hand spin and then to him a Gansey. This is a picture of Blue Face Leicester hand spun Gansey yarn. Uh, this person is spindling on a beach. Definitely don't show my husband that. 
So it says here, there's this whole section that I really liked about breeds of fleece suitable for hand spinning a Gansey. It says, right the very first sentence, a Gansey worsted requires a true long wool. For example, blue face Leicester. Wensleydale would work, Lincoln long wool would work. Um, in the Yorkshire wool industry, there's no such thing as breed specific yarn. That's a modern construct. So, but still, long wools are terrific for this. And um, there's a useful guide called the Bradford Yarn Count, um, which she talks about here to sort of explain more minutely the characteristics of suitable yarn. And then, of course, um, let's see, common long wools used um, for Gansies and then bold of the Yorkshire breeds. So we have BFL, regular Leicester, Cotswold, Gotland, Lincoln, Masham, which is a Yorkshire breed, Perrindale, Romney, Swaledale, Yorkshire breed, Teeswater, Yorkshire breed, Texel, and Wensleydale, which is a Yorkshire breed. Um, those are spindle whorls. They look like urchins, but they're not. Um, and then there's yarn characteristics for spinning in Gansey worsted. So you spin using the worsted style. Um, you spin to maintain luster. Three singles together to give a circular cross section. Spin for smoothness. Spin from the tip. Control your drafting zone. Uh, and deal with slubs as you make them as you go to make the yarn as smooth as possible. So I like that she gives the option for hand spinning a Gansey because obviously in the, you know, 17th century, that's what they were doing. But she also says you can use commercial yarn too. The last section are Gansey patterns. And there are patterns here, but they are still in the, um, they still live in the theoretical. Although they're patterns, I mean, you can use a lot of these motifs across, um, knit them into different sweaters. Don't, don't feel like you're beholden to knit one complete sweater without modifications. So Phoebe Carr is this sweater. Um, here are some of the motifs. They're simple knit pearls with cables. This is a star shape, diamonds, diamonds with cables on the sides. Um, the Ibiza has three of those stars, some like mountainy things, uh, and then initials underneath. Again, um, they give you, this is the design on the sides, which is kind of like a star, but not really. There's also a heart design, should you choose to use that. This is a good picture of the armpit um, gusset or welt that they were talking about before. Whitby worms, which is sort of cabled and is turtleneck. Parthenope or Parthenope. I'm not sure about the pronunciation on that. The photos are f kind of far away, honestly, to show some of the patterns of the sweaters. Um, they do have the charts here that show you the designs, like there's an anchor and two hearts and other stuff, but I, I don't know. I wish I could have seen it on the sweater better. You can kind of see a little of it there, but still it's hard to see. The Lizzie Lee is a little bit better, uh, easier to see there. Um, diamonds on the sides, cables, mock turtleneck. Sunk Island, it's a kid sweater. And then she includes an alphabet for all Gansey. So if you'd like to put somebody's initials or name on a sweater, if you're going to name them a Gansey, you can do so. Um, and she does them in two different ways. So there's this kind, which is just knits and pearls, and then this kind, which has... Um, some sort of outlining on it. The standard list of abbreviations, techniques, and symbols. The bibliography that she used, which is extensive. So here's one, and then here's one, and then here's one. There's more than three pages of sources that were used in the creation of this book. And then a brief bit about the author, and of course the acknowledgments, and about cooperative press. This book is a delightful read if you're interested in the history of, of things, especially of Gansey's um, or of the area in which Gansey's came, from which the Gansey's came. 
I would not use this as your be-all and end-all source for knitting actual Gansies. If you want to make sure you get it right and historically accurate, absolutely. If you just want to knit a sweater that has knits and pearls, maybe don't start here. Um, that said, it is a very entertaining read. Um, it was something that I kept on my Kindle and I just read uh, in pieces when I had time and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So feel, um, feel encouraged to pick up a copy of River Gansies. Um, published by Cooperative Press. And don't forget Cooperative Press has changed the way they do their book selling, so make sure to go to cooperativepress.com to learn all about that. And that's my review of River Gansies. There's a fire someone shouted, fire in the hall, and a an northwest wind across the deck to chill the very swamp. Their courage would be tested for that awful night was through. Of cowards there were many, of heroes just a few. With only six months' service, she was just off Ilo. The captain looked for shelter when the gale commenced to blow. The captain, he dropped anchor in the lee of Haven shore. He said, we'll be protected here till morning light for sure. Then came the call of fire and a mad rush for the boats. There being only two seaworthy and one that would not float. The crew abandoned first with just three men from below. The captain took the jolly boat and two more foot a row. There's a fire, someone shouted, fire in the hole, and a northwest wind across the deck. Till the very end.